Inside class, welcome back for another Flex Time Review. As you can see, we are inside of the human head and we've got a fully functioning human brain right beside us. Today, we're going to be taking a nice little guided tour of the human brain, hosted by yours truly. There are going to be a lot of different brain parts you have to remember for the AP Psych Test, so I'm going to do my absolute best to teach them in a way that is easiest for your hippocampus to encode the information into your long-term memory. If you don't understand what that means, you will soon. Let's get started. The first section of the brain we are going to explore is going to be the brain stem. The brain stem is going to include both hindbrain and midbrain structures. The brain stem is one of the most primitive areas of the brain and it is the first to develop. We are going to see that the parts of the brain located in the forebrain are generally responsible for instinctual and unconscious problems. Processes. Traveling up our spinal cord, the first area of the brain we reach is the medulla. The medulla is going to play a role in basic life-sustaining functions. These are things such as breathing, heart rate, and respiration. On top of that, the medulla also controls a number of vital life reflexes, such as swallowing, coughing, and sneezing. Due to its responsibility controlling several vital life functions, Damage to the medulla can be proven fatal. Directly above our medulla, we have the pons. The pons is going to be a hindbrain structure that connects the medulla to the cerebellum. Pons is Latin for bridge, which does make sense because it does connect our midbrain to our forebrain. On each side of the pons, large bundles of axons connect to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is going to be responsible for muscle coordination as well as maintaining posture and balance. The cerebellum is also responsible for some of our automatic movements and motor skills. So you're able to text away at your phone without even looking at your keyboard all because of your cerebellum. And for the last area of the hindbrain, we have the reticular formation. The reticular formation is going to be a network of nerve fibers that helps regulate attention, sleep, and arousal. It allows for neural messages to be sent to higher brain regions, as well as down to the spinal cord. While considered part of the brainstem, the reticular formation is not very well defined because it does include neurons located in different parts of the brain. But for our sake, we'll categorize it as hindbrain. The remaining area of our brainstem is going to consist of the midbrain. The midbrain is going to be the smallest brain region, which is involved in the basic processing of auditory and visual information, as well as motor control. The substantia nigra is a dope midbrain structure that is substantial in the production of dopamine. You like that? The substantia nigra is dope because it produces dope. I mean, the substantia nigra is part of a larger neural pathway that helps prepare other brain areas to initiate movements or actions. Resting atop our brainstem is the largest area of the brain known as the forebrain. The wrinkly outer portion of the forebrain, containing some of our most sophisticated brain centers, is called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is divided into two nearly symmetrical left and right halves. These halves are connected by a thick bundle of axons known as the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum allows the right and left brain hemisphere to communicate with one another. I like to look at the corpus callosum as the bridge that allows citizens from the left brain to visit citizens of the right brain. Well, imagine a scenario where there are constant accidents on this bridge. If the corpus callosum repeatedly misfires neurons, it can lead to the occurrence of epileptic seizures. The split brain surgery is a procedure when the corpus callosum is cut, severing the connection between the right and left hemisphere. At first glance, there appears to be no real side effects, and people who do receive the procedure go on to live a relatively normal life. But as discovered in 1959 by neuropathologist Roger Sperry, under controlled conditions, side effects can be pointed out. I'm not going to go into Sperry's study too much in this video, but if you would like to learn more, you can click the link in the description box. It's going to bring you directly to the part of my Unit 2 review video where I start talking about the split brain procedure. Each cerebral hemisphere can be divided into four different regions or lobes. Located near the temple, the temporal lobe serves as the primary processing area for auditory information. This should be an easy one to remember. Temple, temporal, ear, hearing. Capiche? Behind the temporal lobe, located in the back of the cerebral cortex, we have our occipital lobe. The main duty of the occipital lobe is to process visual information. When you forget what the function of the occipital lobe is, you just have to spell it out. O. C. Above the occipital and temporal lobe, we have our parietal lobe, which processes somatic sensations. These are things such as touch, pressure, and even temperature. And for our last lobe, by far the largest in all of the cerebral cortex, the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe processes voluntary muscle movements and is in charge of thinking, planning, and emotional control. Now that does it with the lobes of the forebrain, but before we say goodbye to our forebrain, let's take a quick second to look at some of the cortical areas in our lobes. Cortical areas are just going to refer to specialized regions within the cerebral cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the very front part of your frontal lobe. This brain region is responsible for a variety of complex behaviors, planning being the biggest one. It also greatly contributes to personality development. The prefrontal cortex does not fully develop in most individuals until they are about 25 years old, which can explain why when you age you start to mature and make better decisions for the most part. 
So until then, you can blame all your poor decision making on your underdeveloped PFC. So don't quote me on that if you ever get in trouble. Well, I guess you can because technically this is on video and I just quoted myself. All right, before I confuse myself, let's move on. The primary motor cortex, or simply the motor cortex, located in the frontal lobe as well, is responsible for the production of skilled movements. A third of your primary motor cortex is dedicated to facial muscles, while another third is dedicated to hand muscles. This disproportionate representation from these two body areas can be explained by looking at how we as humans can produce a wide variety of hand movements and facial expressions. To remember the PMC, all you need to do is look at this horrifying image. Ah! Yes, that visual is ingrained in your brain forever now. There is absolutely no getting it out. I've tried. Located in the post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe, we have the somatosensory cortex. Let's break down this word somatosensory. Soma, to, sensory. I've talked about soma meaning body on multiple occasions. The function of the cortex is right there in its name. The somatosensory cortex is responsible for receiving and processing sensory information from all over the body. Next, we're gonna talk about two specialized areas in our brain that are responsible for speech. For a majority of people, Wernicke and Broca's area is located in the left hemisphere. Located in the superior temporal gyrus, we have Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is responsible for receptive speech. Wernicke's aphasia occurs when damage to the area leads to difficulty in understanding other speech. Located in the inferior frontal gyrus, I love the name of these brain locations, we have Broca's area. Responsible for our productive speech, it is Broca's area that is allowing me to speak right now. To remember Broca's area, just picture an Italian man saying his speech is broke, and you will easily remember the function. Scusi, scusi, me speech is a broca. I want to take a second to apologize to all Italians. I know with my use of the word capiche and the stereotypical portrayal of an Italian-American accent that I'm on thin ice. Mi dispiace. All right, now let's say goodbye to our cerebral cortex so we can head to the final area of our brain tour, the limbic system. The word limbic means border, and you can see that in our brain, limbic structures border around the brain stem. The hippocampus is a curved forebrain structure that is involved in the learning and formation of new memories. And for my favorite way to remember any part of the brain, you will always remember seeing a hippo on campus. <laughs> The hypothalamus is a peanut-sized brain structure responsible for regulating behaviors related to survival, such as eating, drinking, and sexual activity. There are the four Fs to remember the role of the hypothalamus. Here is the PG version. Feeding, fighting, flighting, and sexual functioning. Next up, we have the thalamus. The thalamus is going to process sensory information for all senses except for smell. It then relays this information to the cerebral cortex. And the last area of the brain, and the one that makes teenagers angsty and full of emotion, the amygdala. The amygdala is an almond-shaped cluster of neurons that is involved in memory and emotional responses, especially those related to fear and aggression. I always like to picture a girl named Amy G. Dalla who likes to go around and bully other people. Shows a lot of unwarranted aggressive behavior. Well, that does it for me and our tour of the brain. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I will see you all next time.